Midnight Sun. Circle City seems to be misnamed. For one thing, it is 80 miles from the Arctic Circle. For another, the peak summer population is 75 people. During the gold rush of the last century, it boasted 20 saloons and it was reputed to be the flesh pot of the North. Now, only 40 or so cabins remain standing, and only 10 of these are habitable, the rest in progressive stages of ruin. Most of the shacks are crude constructions of wood, tar paper, and galvanized tin. There are no streets and no sidewalks. The yards grow wild with weeds and various debris of junk metal. Savage huskies are chained to door frames and yelp noisily at my unfamiliar face. My last lift was in the back of a pickup truck. It was bitterly cold when we were moving. One of the Indians in the cab lent me his heavy flannel jacket and passed around a bottle of cheap wine. These same Indians now led me to their cabin. It was cramped and poverty-stricken, yet somehow managed the air of being comfortable. A battery-powered record player sits on the table. The woodsy wail of folk hero Johnny Cash plays from a badly scratched album. The batteries are low and distort his voice. The men laugh and argue. They drink huge amounts of whiskey and wine. I can't keep up and sit aloof, happy to be warm and drunk and in good company. They ask me where I'm going and why. I tell them north, as far as possible, to see the midnight sun. They think I'm either lying or crazy. I tell them I have no money, but show them welfare food coupons. An old man was their chief. His name was Irving John. He was 90 and had 13 children. It was his house, and I was his guest. As the hours pass, the men get drunker and argue loudly. One passes out and falls off his chair. They laugh and leave him on the floor. They started picking fights amongst themselves. The largest one stares at me angrily. He wants to fight. The old man restrains him. I show them my chillum, an Asian clay pipe. The men are startled. They have never seen anything like it before. The old man nods knowingly. Medicine. He wants to buy it. I refuse. This angers him. He squeezes the bowl with his clenched fist and the fragile clay shatters. I am hurt. He acts surprised and promises to mend it. His squaw collects the pieces and the old man disappears. The largest Indian wants to fight again. The others are neutral. He yanks on my necklace. The string breaks and the beads spill. I retrieve them and stagger from the cabin. The sun wakes me. It is already high in the sky, though my watch shows it's only eight o'clock. My temples throb. My throat is dry. I have a hangover and don't remember falling asleep on the banks of the river. I crawl out of my sleeping bag and wash my face with cold, muddy water. There's a large wooden sign on the bank. It's painted white and proclaims Circle City to be the northernmost terminal of the North American road network. This is it, the end of the road. I look thoughtfully at the Yukon River. I'm reluctant to turn back. There are two white men here. One is the mayor and the other owns the only store and plane. All the other residents are Indians. I met the mayor first. He's sitting on a log wa watching me as I wash up. I walk over to him and ask him where I can buy a cup of coffee. He says I can't. Only supplies are at the trading post and that didn't open till 10. I sit down beside him and light up a cigarette. He likes to talk. I find out the answers to a few questions, then willingly listen as he chooses his own topics. My original hope was to continue north by hitching a lift on a barge. The Yukon River flows northwest from Circle some 90 miles downstream to Fort Yukon, an Indian settlement on the rim of the Arctic Circle. He tells me there aren't any more barges these days and all passenger and freight service is conducted by bush plane, which comes every second day, more or less. A return ticket costs about $20. I finger the 11 cents, which is all the money I have, and I tell him so, and ask if there isn't another way. He gives me an odd kind of stare and says the only way I can get there on 11 cents is to build a raft and just drift down. That doesn't sound like too practical an idea to me, I tell him so. He shrugs his shoulders and says the miners used to do it, and the occasional Indian still does. He's an interesting talker, but after a couple of hours I've had enough and decide to wander around a bit. In a shack behind the store, a diesel pump chugs rhythmically and mechanically. 
His dull, monotonous drone is broken only by the angry buzz of a chainsaw, the stuttering of an outboard motor, yelping huskies, and the laughter of Indian children playing in the tall grass. Further back of the store is a gravel runway which serves as a landing strip for the bush plane. The only other items of interest are three historic river boats, the paint peeling and wood rotting, lying abandoned in a swampy field. I'm sitting on the bank of the river again, and the idea of a raft is beginning to appeal to me. In fact, it sounds kind of romantic. Now, I've never been on a raft except in a duck pond. Hello? Hi. Pretty good. Yes, I do. Okay. Right on. Bye-bye. I'm sitting on the bank of the river again, and the idea of a raft is beginning to appeal to me. In fact, it sounds kind of romantic. Now, I've never been on a raft except in a duck pond, but it doesn't sound too bad. I mean, a canoe or a boat you can tip over, but a raft seems pretty well unsinkable. I'm thinking along these lines as a group of Indian boys come by and stop beside me. I can see they're curious and willing to be friendly, but a bit shy. When I tell them that someone was at their party, I was at their party they had last night, and some hangover I had this morning, they started grinning. They ask me if I'm going to be there tonight. I wonder if they're being sarcastic, but I can see they're not. I tell them I have doubts whether I'd be welcome since one of their older brothers wanted to fight me. They said, oh, that's Steve. He always fights when he gets drunk. He probably doesn't even remember it this morning. They say it so matter-of-factly. I begin to wonder if I'm not being oversensitive after all. I can see that some people might like to fight, like some people like watching football games, but I've always treated it pretty seriously. Then I ask if they've ever gone on a raft down to Fort Yukon. They say no, but some of their brothers have. I wonder aloud if the man who owns the trading post would give me some rope and nails and lend me a saw. They said no, pretty definitely, and I, don't see, I see they don't like him. I ask them why, and they say he's a crook, and cheats them when they buy food. Well, the mayor told me that the store owner was worth $70,000, and I know he had to take it out of somebody's hide. I figure it was the Indians who paid for it all right. The trading post was a new log building. Wolf pelts and trapping equipment hung on one wall. Heavy sacks of grain and flour were bunched in a corner. Cases of tin food were stacked in aisles on the cement floor. I guess I disliked the man before I even saw him, but he sure didn't help matters. I asked him to give me nails and ropes for food stamps and he gives me a blunt no. I ask if he lend me a saw and he says no again but he'll lend me scissors to cut my hair. That gets me pretty mad and I go back to the river to sit down and cool off. There is a sled like construction made of wood lying on the bank. It has a log frame about 16 feet long and 8 feet wide. Half of it is covered by 3 8 inch plywood sheets. I begin thinking that it would make a good raft. Better a raft than a boat dolly. Two men in canoes come into sight around six in the evening. I help them beach the canoes, set up camp, and get a fire going. They cook supper for three, and we sit around the fire smoking Bill Durham tobacco and drinking coffee. They left Eagle six days ago and are going to Fort Yukon. I tell them where I'm going and how, and they think it's a great idea. One of them starts telling me how he sailed rafts on the Mississippi when he was a kid. It sounds so good that I make up my mind then and there to start adapting the sled in the morning. The canoeist lent me a hand. I saw the frame in half and cut down four saplings, two for railings and two for oars. I get old rusty spikes from the abandoned cabins and nail two pieces of plywood to the saplings for paddles. I even punch holes in the sides of an old tin can to make a stove. Once I look up and Irving John is standing there above me. I nod, still sore about the chillum, but willing to take advice. Go ashore at night, stay in the middle of the river, stay away from deep cut banks, watch out for whirlpools and gravel bars halfway. Make sure you cross the northern shore in four days. If not, you miss Fort Yukon, sail right down to the Arctic Sea, he smiled. Then he turns and walks away. 
I gather firewood for the stove and buy two weeks supplies of canned food at the trading post. He isn't too happy about taking food stamps, but says right on them good anywhere in America and he has no choice. He gets pretty red though when he sees what I did to his boat dolly. The whole settlement is there. The Indians, the mayor, the canoeists, even a tourist from Nebraska who takes a picture of me on the raft for his hometown newspaper. The raft's heavy and it takes six men to drag it into the water. One final shove, the current catches me. I am on my way. I remember Irving John's advice about staying in midstream and try to row away from shore. I row and row to my shirts just wet with sweat and my arms aching like they'll fall off, but I'm still only about ten yards from shore. As soon as I pause, the current sweeps me even closer. I understand right away that these oars aren't going to be as good as I thought they'd be. In fact, I'm beginning to suspect the current's going to take me where it wants to go, and I don't have much say in the matter. This suspicion is confirmed when I reach the first slough. The raft enters a side channel and almost immediately it narrows and the current slows to practically nothing. At first I get uptight and impatient because I'm hardly moving. Then I get a sinking feeling in my stomach as I wonder what would happen if it petered out into a dead end. I tell myself not to worry and eventually I begin to relax and enjoy it. I have lots of food. I open a can of corned beef and a package of cookies. I even light a fire and make a cup of coffee. I take off my shirt and light my pipe. The sun warms and I puff contentedly. It isn't exactly a forest. The trees are too sparse and stunted for that. It's more like a wild garden in its raw and primitive state. An arctic garden of Eden, still virgin to the species of man. I begin to feel that rafting is an ideal way to travel. It sure beats walking. The woods drift by leisurely, twigs crackle in the tin can giving sweet smoke. I can see all kinds of birds and rabbits, and even a bull moose who can't quite believe me and lumbers off into the bush. All of a sudden the slough rejoins, rejoins the main stream, and the current carries me due north. It looks more like a lake than a river. After a while I'm a mile or two from the nearest shore. The mayor told me the river was 30 miles wide at some points, but I didn't realize. A lone seagull circles hopefully in rings around the raft. I drop breadcrumbs behind me, glad for the company. This raft feels mighty small in all this water. Black clouds come up from behind. The temperature drops and I put on my nylon jacket. The sky fractures with lightning. A moment later, a roll of thunder, my hair bristles with static electricity. A few scattered drops fall against my cheek, wet and heavy, the stove sizzling. A celestial dam bursting and rain flooding down. It falls in sheets of water, making the river choppy and limiting vision to a hundred yards. Its fury passes in the first half hour, settling down to a steady drizzle. I'm cold and wet, and so is the firewood. I wait patiently for the clouds to disperse and the sun to burst into new life. Hours pass. I'm making good time. Heavy earth from overhanging cliffs falls into the water making gunshot sounds. I see the slough about a mile downstream and decide to follow it north in calm water. When I get closer though I think it's too narrow and try to roll into the main stream. My rowing must cancel the natural tendency of the current. With growing horror, I head straight for the jutting bank which divides the current in two. A driftwood log jam fronts the bank of the island. At the last moment, when I know a crash is inevitable, I throw myself on the floor. I roll, roll with the shock of impact and scramble to my feet. One corner of the raft is caught on a log. It's stuck, and the current rushes by wildly on either side. I use the oar as a lever to pry it loose. The oar snaps. I fall backwards, pushing the end of the raft under water. I lunge forward, but within seconds the raft begins to tip. The stove slides off into the river. Instinctively I grab the sleeping bag and throw it ashore. The box of canned food is held only by my feet. I try to reach it while hanging on to the railing with one arm, but the current is too powerful and wrests it from my grasp. I choke on a mouthful of water and barely manage to pull myself onto the jammed logs. 
I crawl on my hands and knees to the bank and hoist myself up by the roots of a bush. As I pause to catch my breath, I begin to shake. My muscles tremble uncontrollably in spastic jerks. I know it's from shock as well as the cold. My stomach is gnarled into a knot. Suddenly the bowels relax and I barely have time to pull down my jeans. I'm cold. My clothes are soaking but now the shaking has stopped. I'm overcome by exhaustion and can barely stand. I strip off my clothes and crawl into the sleeping bag to get warm. When I wake, it comes as a surprise to find I've been asleep for several hours. One fifth of the raft shows above the surface. The knapsack, if the rope is held, must be six feet under water. Worst of all, the food is at the bottom of the river and beyond recovery. I'm ready to bawl, but it costs too much effort. I stare numbly at the submerged raft in dismay. I'm stranded, and there's a very real danger of slowly starving to death. I have to pry it loose, but half an hour passes before I find the courage to crawl back out on the log jam. I push, but it doesn't budge. I use the remaining oar as a lever. It moves slightly, but the current's pressure is too great, and the oar snaps in two. I pause to regain strength, then wedge myself between a log and the raft, pushing with all my might. The raft moves slightly, then floats to the surface. I hastily retrieve my wet clothes and sleeping bag, fearful lest it break loose without me. One good shove releases it, and I jump on board as the current takes it. Fortunately, the rope has held, and I am able to pull up the knapsack. I raise my arms to the sky, <laughs> reaching into the stars. I am naked. The breeze ruffles my hair. My laughter echoes through the bush. The exuberance gradually subsides into quiet awe. The only sound is gurgling water, the croak of a frog and the honks of geese winging across a twilight sky. I pass the slough, a second channel, and enter another slough. The sky is blue 24 hours a day, and I continue until 4 a.m., catching four brief hours of rest and start again. The slough is shallow and dead calm. I get off and push, my feet sinking in in the mud bottom, my legs numb by icy water. Three hours later, I reach the main stream and recover an average speed of 8 to 10 miles per hour. It's quiet and peaceful for the rest of the morning. My attention wanders, and I don't see the whirlpool until it's too late to avoid. My forward movement is checked, and I swing around in a circle. I'm apprehensive, remembering stories of whirlpools strong enough to suck under a canoe. This is much smaller, though. On the four fifth or sixth time around, I'm getting dizzy. I lie down on the floor of the raft and wait for the merry-go-round to stop. A more serious situation arises later when a sudden change of current swerves me under an overhanging bank. A small tree hangs straight down, its tips trailing in the water. It's directly in my path and threatens to snag me with the current swamping the raft from behind. I grab the branches and push upwards with all my might. I lift high enough to clear the raft, but disturb the roots of the tree, creating a shower of loose stones and mud. I kneel on the floor, looking up at tons of earth blotting out the sky. Lumps of wet clay splatter the raft. My heart races as I wait expectantly for the coup de gras. It doesn't come, and the raft swings clear from harm. Once again, an interlude of rest, during which nothing more exciting happens than the sighting of a bear and her cubs. Then I entered the slough. Then I entered a slough different from the others. The current increased instead of abating, and the slough widened instead of narrowing. Then I see the trees, huge driftwood logs in parallel groupings, as mysterious and inexplicable as the stone statues of Easter Island. Suddenly, it becomes clear. The slough is a trap. 
impossible to retreat because of the current and the exit blo blocked by gravel bars. The raft hits bottom, frees itself, then grounds again. I jump off, push it free, but it grates again, solidly. I curse and push and pull like a madman, gaining inches, but at an exorbitant cost. Energy depletion, gasping for breath. Light rain falling all morning, water level, rising or falling. Gamble, seeking warmth, rest, buried in sleeping bag. Four hours, waking, checking water level, two inches. Fever, insanity, cursing, pushing, every ounce of muscle strength, raft frozen, feet sliding in loose gravel, falling on my face. Cold water has a sobering effect. Not knowing what else to do, I sit down. I still can't accept it, yet I have to. The journey is finished. Nothing to do but wait. For a search party? Maybe. How long? Who knows? It's a shame about all that food at the bottom of the river could be two, three weeks before rescue. No need to panic. Fast. No physical danger. It'll get you stoned. Suddenly feeling alone, my individuality becomes a curse. My idealism a cheap facade for failure. I've been an outlaw all my life, a debt to be paid in full. Why self-denial? Why self-destruction? Tears flowing down my cheeks and sobbing uncontrollably. God! I screamed in anger. My fists clenched and smashing down on the plywood floor. Sleep forgives. Its merciful arms comfort me like a mother its child. A new day. The rising sun gives freely of its energy to warm my limbs to life. I wash my face in the river, drink deeply its muddy water, sediment grating on my teeth, as thick as soup. Problem number one. Some sort of SOS signal possibly out of stones gathered on the from the riverbed. Better still, I take a roll of tin foil from the knapsack and wrap it around the railing and oar. It reflects the sun's rays like a jewel. A smile of satisfaction on my face. It should light up like a Christmas tree when seen from the air. Problem number two, finding a book of wet matches, separating them carefully and letting them dry. Eventually gathering firewood snagged in the roots of the driftwood trees. Lighting a fire and keeping it going. Something to do. Problem number three. Keeping busy. It's amazing how little there is to do on an 8 by 8 foot raft. Luckily I have a penknife. Searching for a piece of driftwood. Carving a plaque. Brian John Griefson, Yukon Raft Expedition, June 18, 1970. Keep track of the time. Difficult in perpetual sunlight. One ring notched for each passing day. Cut, cut tin foil in strips in certain recessed characters. Nice contrast, liquid silver and wood grain. Waste two days. On the evening of the fourth day, I hear an engine. It's a motorboat. I watch it pass the mouth of the slough. I can even see two men inside. I shout and wave frantically. They can't hear me above the noise of their engine. They don't look my way. The sound of their motor fades. I decide to cross the island tomorrow and work my way through the bushes to the mouth of the slough. I'll have a better chance of flagging a boat there. Today is June 21st, the longest day of the year. I sit in the half lotus position, meditating on the setting sun. If I was at the Arctic Circle, it wouldn't have set at all. Even here, it only sets part way, then moves horizontally along the horizon to rise again, tracing a horseshoe curve. For two or three hours, the sky blends bright red, purple, and orange, shifting bands of color. Sunset and sunrise combine. I sit cross-legged without moving, without speaking, in total awe of the magnificence of God's creation. The swirling murmur of the river symphony is by now as familiar as my own heartbeat. It is the all-pervading alm of the river's breath. The cry of a loon, of a single duck, or a seagull mantra was in complete ecological harmony with this Arctic paradise. The morning of the fifth day. I hoisted the sleeping bag over my shoulders along the knapsack and picked up the broken oar. I took one last look at the raft. 
It seems very small, yet I leave it behind with reluctance. It's shallow almost to the bank where the water creeps to thigh level. I need both hands to hold the oar in front of me. The current's quite strong. If I slip, the weight of the knapsack will dra drag me under. The ice water numbs my legs. The lack of food has taken its toll. I pause frequently to rest. It's hard work beating a path through virgin bush. Thorns and thist thistles tear at my skin, and more than once I trip over logs hidden by dense undergrowth. On the raft I was isolated from insects, but now the mosquitoes attacked in force. Sweat mingles freely with blood and insect corpses. It takes me two hours to cover a distance a little over a mile, when I reach the grassy knoll overlooking the main stream. I clear some weeds away and gather old sticks for a fire. The smoke smarts my eyes, but it discourages some of the mosquitoes. I tie my shirt and jeans to the top of saplings to draw attention to my camp. I build a lean-to to shelter from heavy branches. An engine wakes me in the morning. It's a long ways from shore, but I can see a large barge painted yellow. By squinting my eyes, I can make out a man standing on deck. I grab my shirt and wave frantically. The whine of the engine lowers in key, and the barge reduces speed. I wave wildly. This time it looks as if the man waves back, then incredulously. The engine picks up speed, and its whine fades into the distance. The ecstasy I felt shatters like broken glass. Bastard! I scream. Then the anger drains away. It's too much effort. Today is the sixth day since I left Circle, and the sixth day without food. The initial hunger pains had disappeared long ago, and now I couldn't bother looking for roots. One day, more or less, doesn't make much difference. I sink back on the grass in a lethargic mood. One lifetime, more or less, doesn't matter either, yet I want to live and can't deny it. There's something about the color of a sunset, the texture of a leaf, the smell of the wind. There's an aching in my loins to see a girl laugh, to touch her hair. I hear an engine in the afternoon. This time it's a plane coming straight in from the northwest. As I grab my shirt, it banks a left turn and makes a low pass overhead. I wave calmly to and fro. The pilot makes another pass in recognition of my signal and flies southeast to circle. I hear a motor again a little after eight. I smother the fire with my boot, roll up my sleeping bag, and sling the knapsack over my shoulder. Strange, but now it's safe. I'm beginning to feel a little embarrassed about being rescued. As the boat rounds the bend, I recognize Irving John running the motor and his eldest son at the bow. I wave to get their attention, and they come straight towards me. The son turns and says something to his father. Even at that distance, I can see the grin on their faces. The End